The Taliban have announced a new government from Kabul, 20 years after they were driven from power. For a generation that grew up with education, international investment and hope in a democratic future, reading that line must feel scarcely believable. So how did the previous administration fall so quickly? The Taliban went from taking control of their first major city to arriving at the gates of Kabul in just 10 days, but the capital, it was assumed, would be different. Most observers believed that Kabul would hold until a negotiated agreement could take place. On Sunday the 15th of August, that all changed. Within hours, the president and his top officials had fled. What was left of the Afghan army and police forces changed out of their uniforms, and went into hiding. The Western-backed Afghan government, backed by trillions of dollars in military support and training over two decades, had simply melted away. Sami Sadat, a former Afghan army commander in Helmand, the country's largest province, was drafted in to head a new Kabul security team. The plan was to fight if necessary, but ideally to try to secure a peaceful settlement with the Taliban. If that couldn't be achieved, then the Kabul administration wanted at the very least to buy time for evacuations. But even as Lieutenant Gen Sadat met his top team, Taliban were taking over the largest city in the north of the country, Mazari Sharif, and were beginning to pour into the eastern city of Jalabad. Both cities were falling with barely a fight. Kabul was the last city standing. Ashraf Ghani, a former academic and World Bank official, had been president of Afghanistan since September 2014. Critics within the Afghan government told us he had consistently failed to assess the Taliban threat accurately during the final weeks of their advance. But no doubt at the forefront of his mind was the fate of former President Mohammad Najibullah. In fact, Mr. Ghani went on to reference this moment of history when he later explained his reasons for leaving. Mr. Najibullah was captured by the Taliban when the group took over Kabul in 1996. Taliban fighters dragged him out of the UN compound where he was sheltering and tortured him. After killing him they hung his body from a traffic light outside the presidential palace. As day broke there was growing unease among residents as reports emerged of Taliban fighters arriving at the city gates, and queues had begun to form at the banks and airport. But President Ghani's inner circle still believed that a fall to the Taliban was not imminent. Staff at the Elj, Kabul's imposing 19th century presidential palace, arrived for work as usual. Confidence would have been bolstered by an agreement brokered the previous day by one of the president's top aides, Salam Rahimi. According to a source close to Mr. Ghani, Mr. Rahimi had been engaged in back channel communications with the Taliban and had managed to secure an agreement that the group would refrain from taking over the city by force, in exchange for an interim power-sharing deal. This would allow for the evacuation of foreign nationals, and those under threat, to continue at the airport. It would also buy time for negotiations already underway in Qatar to broker a unity government. In an effort to reassure Kabul's residents, Ghani's team posted a video on Sunday on the official presidential Facebook page, showing him discussing the city's protection with his interior minister and other security officials. It showed him sitting at an ornate wooden desk, talking to his minister on speakerphone. The clip seemed to suggest that an agreement with the Taliban was imminent, and that any fighting in Kabul would be avoided. Meanwhile, a group of about a dozen high-level Afghan politicians were headed to the airport to catch a commercial flight to Islamabad. The group included the Speaker of the House of the People, Miraman Rahmani, and former Vice President Karim Khalili. One member of the delegation, Sheikhib Sharifi, an official with the Ministry of Agriculture, denied later media reports that their trip was an evacuation. Our aim was to convince the Pakistani government to mediate and avoid bloodshed in Afghanistan he said. But President Ghani did not want them to leave. He feared that we would negotiate a deal with Pakistan's help that would cut him out of power. He was totally against us going Mr. Sharifi said. Observers have suggested that the president may also have been anxious to avoid triggering further panic by allowing the parliamentary speaker to leave the country. 
Mr. Sharifi described witnessing a scene of widespread panic in the city as he and the others in the delegation made their way to the airport. We had heard that the Taliban were at the gates, but didn't think they would be so quick to enter the city. The previous night we had been extremely nervous, and we slept with our weapons beside us. There were queues outside banks as people rushed to get dollars out, there were queues at the airport as people tried to get in, and huge amounts of traffic. The traffic was so bad that former Vice President Khalili who was traveling separately to the others, had to get out and walk the last 15 minutes to the airport to make it in time. Once at the airport, the group was receiving regular updates reporting Taliban advances. Every minute we received reports that the Taliban had captured key places in the city. It was frightening. Inside the airport, all semblance of order had collapsed. Soon, border officials and airport security personnel began disappearing, leaving their stations unmanned and passengers unscreened. People began to pour onto the tarmac. Eventually, the delegation made it onto its Pakistan International Airlines flight. But the plane was ordered by air traffic control not to take off, and to await further instructions. We thought that at any minute Taliban militants could take the airport, said Mr. Sharifi. We thought of ways to defend ourselves should they get onto the plane, using what we had. The only thing I could use that was heavy enough was a laptop battery. Back at the presidential palace, the situation was also deteriorating. Mr. Ghani was still frantically trying to reach his top officials in the defense and interior ministries, with little success. We were expecting some sort of guidance from the palace. But nothing came. Mr. Moeb, the 38-year-old Western-educated former Afghan ambassador to the US, was perhaps Mr. Ghani's most trusted aide. Despite him having no military or security background, Mr. Ghani made him his national security advisor in 2018, putting him in charge of crucial military decisions. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe.